Hello, everyone, and welcome to Excuse Me What? Hello, hello. Uh, so today, for our first topic, um, I picked Natalie Wood. I've always been kind of interested in this one, and I don't feel like enough people talk about her story. So I thought it would be a really good start to our brand new podcast, and I think we're both very excited. <laughs> Super excited. <laughs> so um, do you just want to get right into it then? Yeah, I think so. So she's kind of like, if you aren't familiar with her, I think people would describe her as like the Jennifer Aniston or Sandra Bullock of her time. Yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. She definitely started out as a child star, but then kind of transitioned pretty seamlessly into being like a, a young ingenue, as they kept saying in all my research, and <laughs> went on to have a moderately successful uh, adult career. Um, but anyways, let's just get right into it. Um, so her birth name is Natalia, and I'll kind of get more into how her name kind of changed to be Natalie Wood. But um, she was born July 20th, 1938 in San Francisco. She was the oldest of two girls. Um, her parents were Russian immigrants, and their names were Nikolai, but he also went by Stefan, and her mom's name was Maria. It's interesting that he went by Stefan, even though his name is Nikolai. Like, well, they're not even similar. Even well, a but bit. if you actually look at their full name, uh, I think that's their last name or part of their middle name. I didn't oh. want to get too into <laughs> her actual Russian name because there's no way I would have said that right. So I'm like, we'll just kind of, you know, <laughs> run Move past along. that. Move <laughs> along. Move along. Uh, so kind of going into like her early childhood, um, shortly after her birth, her family actually moved to Santa Rosa. And at that time, crew members on a film set first noticed Natalie in Santa Rosa. Her mother then moved the family to LA to pursue a film career for Natalie. And as a child actress, David Lewis and William Getz of RKO changed her name to Natalie Wood. Probably because her real name was pretty difficult to say. And her mom, like, from what I researched, her mom was, like, the quintessential, like, stage mom, wasn't oh, she? Oh, absolutely. But, like, with a little, little pinch of crazy. Yeah, she seemed a little, like, from what I heard, I listened to a podcast called the, what is it, the Fatal, Fatal Voyage. Voyage? Or the Final Voyage? Fatal Voyage. Fatal Voyage. And they went in really, really deep on this, and so I would recommend checking that out because it's, like, really, really in-depth. Absolutely. Um, her sister was on there and talked about how kind of crazy her mom was just about Natalie. Yeah, honestly, I would say it was probably kind of similar to, like, Macaulay Culkin's upbringing. Yes. Her, fa her mom absolutely used her as, essentially, a source of income yes. for the family. So I, I don't think... Had her mom pushed her into that kind of career path, I don't know that she ever would have gone down that path. Is it was definitely her mom that really pushed her, <laughs> and her mom kind of made her like I think in her adult life, because of all the stuff that happened to her as a kid, she seemed very very neurotic. Yeah, absolutely, lots of anxiety and like phobias and absolutely, yeah, so, interesting. Um, yeah, definitely check out that podcast if you want more in depth of kind of like her whole life and especially the event that we're covering yes um but kind of moving into more of her career just to kind of give a uh, background on her career um she uh, in 1943 her first film debut was only 15 seconds of screen time in the movie happy land that's significant <laughs> <clears throat> absolutely well i mean it kind of was she was noticed by director ivan is it pitchell Pichelle? <laughs> Pichelle. Um, we'll say Pichelle. Yeah, and this relationship with um, this director actually was the reason that prompted their move to L.A. two years later. Hmm. Um, so then in 1946, she started Tomorrow is Forever um, by uh, Dr. Orson Welles. Welles said of her performance that it was so good she was terrifying. And understand, she was still really young at this point. For So even as a young child actress, people could see that she had kind of like a natural talent for this. For sure, for sure. Absolutely. And then in 1947, her mother signed her to 20th Century Fox for her first major role in Miracle on 34th Street. And I think everyone can agree that this is pretty pivotal role yes. for her. And She's kinda, pretty well known for that role. Absolutely, and definitely kind of launched her 
into child stardom from that role. Um, at that time, she was considered a top child actress in Hollywood after that role. Um, she then starred in over 20 films as a child, which I feel like is kind of a lot. That seems like a lot. Like, I, even when I think of, like, Macaulay Culkin, mm -hmm. like, I don't know that he had as many. Right. So, 20 seems really daunting. I mean, there are some adult actors that don't even have that many films under their belt. Right. And just remember, like, while this is all happening, her mom is always right there. Always there. Right there. Always the in the stands time. telling her what to do. Don't cry. <laughs> don't You're cry. fine. You're not scared. Yeah. Just do it. Yes. Um, and then kind of lost myself here. Um, so because she was in, like, so many films at that time, she actually received her education on studio lots. Um, so by age nine, she was named most exciting juvenile motion picture star of the year, which I think that's kind of weird to say juvenile. <laughs> <laughs> How legit is this award? <laughs> right. Why is it not most but, exciting wait, young you, motion you, picture star of the year? But you also didn't say where this came from. You guys, it came from Parents Magazine. Magazine. How Which, real is this? Well, and the thing is, I didn't even know that Parents Magazine <laughs> Was that all? I just remember seeing it in the magazine I know. racks oh at doctor's office. I gotta be honest, I didn't even know that was a real magazine. <laughs> I, I did no idea. The only time I ever saw it was in a doctor's office. So, again, is that legit? Who's to say? Who's to say? Who's to say? Uh, but as a teenager, she actually kind of transitioned more into television. And then in 1955, she co-starred in Rebel Without a Cause. Again, a pretty pivotal role in her career. She was actually nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Wow. And then in 1956, she signed with Warner Bros. Her career began to decline after a list of bad films, though. So she did kind of see a little bit of a divot in her career. And then in 1961, her career actually rebounded when she starred in Splendor in the Grass. And now from... What I hear from a lot of people, this is actually a really, really incredible movie, so I gotta add that to my list of movies to watch. I, I won't watch it, but I, you I can know watch you it. I know you won't. <laughs> it's not your tease. <laughs> and then, again, in 1961, she also starred in West Side Story, which I'm pretty sure everybody knows what that movie is. Have I seen it? Can't say that I have. Nope, I, I haven't. Can't say But that I, I know it's a big deal for, not some, pe for some peeps. Not a huge musical person. I love a good musical. Like, Grease. That, that's a great musical. That's a great musical. Oh. Any Disney movie ever? I guess I am into musicals. <laughs> <laughs> the Sound of Music? My life has just been changed at this moment. I know, you didn't think that you were a musical fan, but it turns out you really actually are. Yeah, I feel like you learn something new about yourself every day. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? I, didn't, I didn't learn that about you, I knew that. <laughs> I just knew that. Well, and then get this. So even though she had, um, you know, Splendor in the Grass and West Side Story, in 1966, she was given Harvard Lampoon's Worst Actress of the Year Award. But because she was so awesome, she actually accepted that speech in person, which was super rare. Not surprising. <laughs> I think I would do that too. And I'd be like, fuck you guys. You yeah. thought you were going to bring me down and like... Laugh at me without me, and no, I'm right here. Do, say it to my face, bitch. Yeah, and I'm going, um, an award's an award. I'll take uh, it. Yeah, I'm going to display that in my house. Thank you. <laughs> I have to be noticed to be an award receiver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And then um, and she kind of went into semi-retirement, as she called it, in 1970 after the birth of her daughter, Natasha Gregson. But we'll kind of gonna get more into that. But then we're going to move on to Robert A different Wagner. character. A very significant mm -hmm. character in this in this story. I didn't want to spend too much time on him. He, I don't. I want to tell you guys this guy's a garbage person. Just an FYI, and he's still living. Yeah. And he's still a garbage and I, person. And I don't care what uh, Hollywood has to say, because from when I was doing my research, people were like... Most charming man. Yeah, he's the nicest citizen in Hollywood. He's so great. No, he's a garbage person. He's garbage. I don't know how you can... Anyway. We'll get into anyway, it. I digress. I digress. <laughs> so, anyways, anyways, we're talking about Robert Wagner or, or RJ or as RJ. I think I'll just I don't know. I'll kind of flip back and forth. But anyways, it's Robert Wagner. Do not forget the name. 
So he <laughs> he was born in fe- on February tenth in nineteen thirty. He's old as balls. I didn't realize how old he yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's definitely <laughs> older than her. He's gonna die any day. <laughs> Hopefully not too soon. Yeah. I- before justice. Yeah, before justice. You'll get what we're talking about. <laughs> but anyway, so he was born in Detroit. Um, his parents' names were Hazel uh, Elvera and Robert Wagner Sr. Um, his childhood in 1937, the family actually moved to Los Angeles. And I guess he always wanted to be an actor. And he was discovered by a talent agent when he was out eating with his family. How convenient. I will say this. He's actually, when he was younger, he was a good looking guy. He was a good looking guy. He was a very good looking guy. Lots of good looking guys can be assholes. Great hair. He he still does have pretty good hair. It's a little crazy looking now. A little disheveled. He's going for that crazy old man homeless look. You know, run a comb through it. (laughs) You're an actor. Yeah. (laughs) People know you. Just run a comb through it. Maybe some, just some hairspray. Get the wispies. People yeah. know you. Tame the wisps, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Tame the wisps. Just, just run a comb through it. And then okay. briefly about his career, um, his kind of first appearance was an uncredited appearance in 1950 in The Happy Years. You know, when I was doing this, I had to like kind of go back and I was like, wait, were they, did they show up in the same movie? Because hers was um, Happy Land and his was Happy Years. No. I thought it was a typo and it was Happy Days. <laughs> so, I, I know, I went back to it and I was like, wait, was he in but, that show? But Happy Days was so much later. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it really was. It was like that time frame, but uh, not actually. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. And then uh, same year, 1950, he was signed by 20th Century Fox. Um, he actually played mostly romantic leads, which again, if you look up pictures of him, it doesn't really surprise me because yeah. he, he was a good looking guy. Sense. He's like tall and handsome. Long and leg suave, great Like hair. that typical quintessential like leading romantic leading man, man in that time in that era yeah absolutely sure. so that does that didn't really surprise me but he actually surprised everyone when in 1952 he played a veteran with a song in my heart which showcased his ability to do dramatic roles he also played in more serious roles with uh prince valiant in 1954 the true story of jesse james in 1957 And he played a killer in A Kiss Before Dying in 1956. Eventually, he also went on to do television. He starred in the show It Takes a Thief from 1968 to 1970. And his biggest success was Heart to Heart, which ran from 1979 to 1984. Um, And... You guys, in case you didn't know, he also played number two in the Austin Powers movie. Yeah, that's probably what, like, our generation would know him best as. Right, is number right. two in the Austin Number Powers. two in the Austin Power movies. So, kind of getting into um, them. Where do these two people come together? So, uh, they would actually, well, at least Natalie. I don't know that he ever really took notice of her, but she definitely did. She uh, and he's significantly older. Isn't yeah. He? Well, I wouldn't say he's significantly older. I think if I don't know. You do let the me, math. Let me look here. You, she, you do the math. She was born in 1938, and he was born in what 1930. Yeah. So he he's eight years older. No, that's not so, massive. Okay, when you're older, not massive. But when you're the age that they were when they met. Yeah. Um. So she was ten. <laughs> And it, it wasn't so much that they met, but she would see him around the studio a lot, and she had a big crush on him, and she actually told her mom, was it her mom, she said, I'm going to marry him someday? Yeah. yeah. At like 10. Which, I don't know bold. that- Bold. Ma'am, you're bold. <laughs> I don't know that that's really what I was thinking about when I was 10. I think I was just playing in dirt somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> eating dirt. Yeah. Eating dirt, you know. <laughs> at 10. It, a slow learner. <laughs> Yeah, that's not food. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they starred together um, in only one movie, and it was All the Fine Young Cannibals. Um, her I mom, don't know if I want to see that. I don't know. I hear it's really good. It's uh, The title scares me. Well, I mean, cannibals is a bit jarring, no matter how you swing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then her mom actually called his publicist, which seems like a lot. Um, um, mom is meddling again. <laughs> yeah. Her mom called the, his publicist to set up a date for the two. Not when she was 10. This is later. It's not when she was 10, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Very 
important note. Very important note. Otherwise, she was that ten. She was an adult. Otherwise, I would have called CPS. She was an adult. <laughs> yeah, a young adult. Young adult. <laughs> Barely an adult. <laughs> yeah. So, and they went on their first date um, when she was eighteen and he was twenty six. See, that's kind of a big age difference. I think at that age. At that age, you know when. But probably not uncommon for that time period. No, probably not at all. Well, and our, our parents are eleven years apart. Granted, obviously a different time frame. But, but also, still. they were both well into adulthood. Yeah, well well <laughs> into adulthood. Well, Dad barely. <laughs> Dad was 26. Oh, yeah, okay, I suppose. I don't know, did you feel like an adult at 26? I don't really feel like an adult at 27. So. No, I don't either. I don't think you ever do. I keep waiting for that to happen. You know, I just, I, it's not going to happen, and that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. But then get this. On December 6, 1957... He actually proposed to her. He took her out to dinner and he did that whole, oh, put a ring in a champagne glass thing. Shut up, really? Which I'm sure she absolutely died because, you know, if you have a crush on this person for a 10 year, who actually marries their crush? No. Not, not a lot of people. Her and Katie Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> well, did they end up well for either one of them? No. no that's why you don't marry a crush. <laughs> don't marry. <laughs> you know what? That's the lesson learned in this episode and in Katie Holmes. Don't marry your crush. Yeah. It never ends the way you want it to end. Absolutely, because you're just so blinded by like at least beauty. at least Katie Holmes made it out alive. <laughs> just saying, foreshadowing. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> well, little foreshadowing there. But then they wasted no time because on December twenty eighth, si- whoa, same month, same like month, like twenty days later. <laughs> yeah, they got married. Um, And Natalie was really excited. You know, she wanted more stability in her life due to her upbringing with her mom and everything. Lots of moving around with her mom being cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. (laughs) You know, she wanted a more stable house. (laughs) She wanted a close family. She wanted children. She just wanted a home. She wanted normalcy. So, and at 18, with the upbringing that she had, I can't really blame her. No, I can't either. Like... I'm sure she was looking for a way to, like, escape. Yeah. And she saw this handsome man that was into her that she's always had a crush on and was like, this is it. This is my ticket out. And it's going to be great. And because think of yourself when you're, like, that young. You're like, how could this go wrong? Well, you know, just to kind of say, I'm sure it all just kind of felt like just this dreams come true. Because I got married when I was 20. And I know I would just, and I mean, I still love my husband. For sure, for sure. Absolutely love him. I look back and I'm like, you had no business. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and, but at that time, I had like zero doubts. I just felt like this is, this is the right choice. I was like on cloud nine. Yeah. So for someone to, you know, not only date their crush, but then to be proposed to by their crush and get married to their crush at 18. Right. And he's so much older and you're like, oh, he's got all this stuff together. Look at him. I, I certainly don't think I had the maturity at 20 to fully understand like necessarily what I was stepping to. So I can't imagine at 18, like she was like, oh, this is really serious. I'm getting married. I'm sure she was just like elated right and just excited like you said like a dreamland like a fantasy Mm -hmm. they were actually considered to be a dream uh couple by the public hollywood loved them and the studios definitely kind of pushed that narrative yeah you know again i still think that's a thing that happens now but definitely back then like uh, huge during this era a lot of film studios would like put their bigger film stars together yeah a lot of times like play matchmaker which is really strange yeah it's so strange and it was like i mean they would push it out to like the media outlets and go like oh these two are together it was just strange mm-hmm. but yeah the the public loved them hollywood loved them and <laughs> but uh honestly natalie was actually considered a bigger star than RJ was. Because she was a boss ass bitch. Mm -hmm. Even with her kind of dip in her career, I mean, again, she did 20 films as a child. Here's the thing with like RJ or Robert Wagner is like his career, he's had like a very steady career, but he's never had like huge peaks where he's like, he's the leading man and awesome. Like he's never been, he's played a few leading roles, but he's never been viewed as, as like, this is, like, a leading actor and he yeah. can carry stuff. He's always had, like, a steady career. Yeah. But never been, like, 
nobody's he's ever, never been like the out. Brad Pitt. You yeah, know what nobody's I mean? ever been like we. Have Everybody's to have like him. he's a good, solid actor. Yeah, he's all right, which he's is good. not bad. It's not bad, but he's never been like the Brad Pitt or yeah. the George Clooney. Yeah, whereas like Natalie was right. Natalie absolutely was. Um, so the problems in their relationship actually started to happen when his career started to dwindle, which I think is I think absolutely typical. ludicrous. I, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna be upset because. He, your spouse is doing better than you. I think that's kind of typical though. Like when you're used to like being, when you're wanting, when your careers are both going good. Yeah. But then someone else, like think of it in a normal sense. Like if your husband lost his job, Mm -hmm. well, he's probably going to lose some self-confidence. He can't bring in money. So like, it's the same thing. It's just as as an actor, it's more like visible to the public. Well, I mean, at one point in his, his career, he was technically considered unemployed. Yeah. You know, for a couple of years, he actually didn't get, like, any work, and he had problems with the IRS, he, like, Mm -hmm. owed people money, things like that. So, yeah, Natalie definitely, her career was really taking off, and his was kind of starting to come to a stop. Mm Mm-hmm. And then uh, Warren uh, Beatty is a Beatty. 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 I always want to say Beatty. I know. Even well, though in my mind, Beatty. Even though in my mind, I'm like, it's it's Beatty, stupid. Yeah. Just say it. <laughs> so Warren Beatty and Natalie became too close on the set of Splendor in the Grass, which also contributed to um, a, a lot of like the anger and resentment, I would think. And also, um, as we'll come to learn, RJ was. A bit of a psychopath. <laughs> a little bit just crazy. A, just a, you know, just a little bit. Just the tits. Um, he became obsessed with the relationship. And, you know, to be fair, Warren was kind of like a ladies man. He seemed like, okay, <laughs> he seemed like kind of a tool. Yeah, he was a bit of a ladies man. He definitely had a lot of relationships in Hollywood. So, I mean, I will I, give him that. I don't see this in your notes and maybe it's because you didn't hear this part. But I know in that podcast, The Fatal Voyage, mm-hmm. they actually talked about how RJ, while they were, while Warren Beatty and Natalie were filming this movie and he thought they were getting too close, he actually got a gun and went outside Warren Beatty's house. Yeah, like he was going to murder him. him home. Yeah, he followed him he home. He followed him so home. So I think that's important to note, like, <clears throat> he's capable of doing that, which I think is... Most people, most normal people would not do that. Well, and also, I think if you really take a step back, they were also still really young. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's 18 in her early 20s, and he's also in his early, mid-20s. And I, I don't think when your relationship kind of starts that way, in that kind of environment, you're wanting to maintain this facade, you know? Right. Because everyone... You know, I'm sure, like, the studios, the public, everyone... Has this expectation. Yeah, everybody has their own perception, especially when they're not even in your life. And to kind of maintain that can be kind of hard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they, they definitely, even though they there were problems, they both maintained a happy relationship, or at least they... To the um, public. To the public. They kind of put that out there. Oh, everything's fine. We have no problems. We're young and we're in love. We're so happy. Yeah. <laughs> But then, oddly enough, this is kind of like a weird note, but I thought I would kind of add it. Um, One night, uh, this is kind of from Lana, her sister's perspective. Mm -hmm. Lana was pretty young at this point, but she says she remembers one night Natalie went to her parents' house with a cut on her hand. She had like a napkin and she was bleeding and she was crying. And Lana said her parents told her, you know, just go to your room, go to your room. Mm. And Natalie also claimed that she caught him cheating. Uh, Wagner. Yes. She caught him cheating with another man. Yes. Yes. I heard this from a couple places. And every time, like, I've seen it, it's kind of glossed over. I'm like, wait, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. It's like I, record scratch. Excuse me, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. Excuse me, what? <laughs> because, like, it's just kind of, just like it is in my notes, it's just kind of casually dropped into it the is. conversation. And in then, that podcast, too, it was like, oh, with another man. And but, you're like, but, like, what year was this? But the thing is, is, like, also, like, that was it. They're like, oh, she said she kind of cheating with another man. But we never, I never found, at least, any, like, further details on that yeah, claim. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, I saw that, too. So, so again, strange. Again, I thought I would add it. Yeah, I just, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but when you're yeah. married, like, yeah. especially in that era of yeah. time, I think that would be super shocking. Oh, absolutely. 
And then on April 1962, they officially divorced. And actually, after they divorced, Natalie started intense Mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. And at that time, what do they call it? Like, analysis. So she'd be like... (laughs) Analysis. She'd go, I'm going to go see my analyst or whatever, which I think (laughs) is so strange. But yeah, they call it like psychoanalysis. Like some of us, like she seems like before her time because... Like, I feel like that was frowned upon back oh, then. yeah. But, like, nowadays, she would have fit in so perfectly. Nobody, like, nobody with her in that new t- age weirdness. I don't even think, like, ten years ago, people would have been yes. so, like, oh, I go to therapy. She's so 2019. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind of. She's a millennial. <laughs> yeah, because she kind of believes in a lot of that. Um, Or it seemed like she believed in a lot of those kind of, like, holistic things mm-hmm. and... Mm -hmm. psychics and well and then in 1966 um uh Beatty kind of came back into her life and was really interested in having her star in a movie with him that he was working on and this visit like caused her to just go into a tailspin and she took a bunch of like barbiturates and attempted suicide in 1966 boy that escalated quickly exactly so uh and thankfully obviously like her stomach was pumped and, and she was fine but that's also kind of like a crazy note that no one ever really kind of went into further detail other than just the statement. Question, do we talk about the water thing that the psychic predicted? Oh, yeah. We, do we talk about that or should we mention that quickly? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and mention okay. that quickly? So, this is something... It, it's this important. Should, yeah, this is an important thing. So, Natalie is super, super terrified of water. Mm-hmm. When she was a little kid, or I think it might have even been before she was born, yeah. her mom went to go see a psychic and the psychic said, you will have a a kid that's famous yeah. that's famous and that will die in with something to do with water yeah and her mom told her this all of the time, the time. All, all the, the time, time. Br- would bring it up to her all the time like you're gonna die in water you're gonna you're gonna die in water like why would you say that to your kid but she said it to her all the time so natalie was petrified, petrified. of water petrified. petrified like super terrified hated water Totally. Well, and it's a good So that's thing. a side note. And it's a good thing that you brought that up because it kind of adds to the mystery yes. of her death. Uh-huh. Totally. And, yeah. So thank you for remembering that. Yeah. But yeah, her mom definitely would bring that up all the time to kind of like, I feel it's like. So weird. Sense of Manipula- like control. Manipulating. manipulating. And at least like Lana kind of said that too. Yeah. Her sister. Yeah. And then in 1969, uh, Natalie married uh, Richard Gregson. Um, in 1962, RJ married Marion Marshall. And, and it seemed like too, when she was married to Richard, like it was a pretty good marriage up until the end. Yeah, absolutely. And in 1970, her and Richard welcomed daughter Natasha Gregson. Um, in 1971, Natalie and Richard, like, I can never say this word, amicably, amicably, yeah, that one. They separated. So, like you said, they it seemed, by all accounts, that they had, like, a, a decent, like, you know... And of... isn't Natasha, she's an actress now, isn't she? Yeah, she goes... She's married to Barry Watson, I think. Is she really? From oh. Seventh Heaven. Oh, yeah. I suppose you're right. Yeah. I suppose you're so right. So, you have seen her, I'm sure. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> And then, um, actually, uh, around this time, after she kind of separated from Richard, her and RJ began began talking on the phone regularly because they would see each other around. I mean, the in Hollywood, Hollywood circle, and yeah. you know, at like parties and things like that. But after um, she separated from uh, Richard, they definitely started talking more regularly. In 1972, they shocked everyone when they attended the Oscars together, and then they randomly sailed off to England together. I don't know. This is, it gets kind of weird here where you're I like, know. what? <laughs> you're like, what's happening? Because this is like, isn't it almost like 10 years after they got divorced? Well, yeah, I suppose. So uh, let me, uh, yeah. It, I mean, yeah, it's like exactly 10 years. So they got uh, divorced the, uh, in 1962. And then they, okay, so in 1972, let me remind you, <laughs> she separated from Richard in 1971. They attended the Oscars together in 1972, and then July 16th, 1972, they got remarried. That's so bizarre. <laughs> they got remarried. But according to them, both uh, Natalie and RJ, they said by all counts um, that their things were different this time, things were better. 
And uh, Natalie was actually quoted as saying, when RJ and I were married, we were like two children acting out a studio script. We deliberately hid our weaknesses from each other. Again, not really surprising for that time. Sure. For that age. I feel like if Natalie was here saying this to me, I'd be like, sure. You were like, you would but just there nod, was a reason. You would nod your head and take a sip of your tea. Ex- exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, she went on to say, now we found that we could really talk to each other. We were not afraid to be ourselves, but we realized that we needed those years apart to reach that understanding. Again, if I was her friend, I'd be like... Okay. Well, her sister said, too, that during this time, she was like, why are you getting married to RJ again? Yeah, what are you and doing? And she said, Natalie had said something to her like, well, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. And I was like, why? That is not a recipe for a good marriage. He, I'm shaking my finger going, no, <laughs> no, no. No. <laughs> no, no. That's not a reason Advice to get married. Advice to any of you, that is not a reason to get married. <laughs> if, if you said that to me about your husband, I'd be like, let me stop Seems you right really there. happy. Pump the brakes. Pump, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pump, pump the, the brakes. brakes. And then in 1974, uh, they welcomed uh, daughter Courtney Wagner to this world. Um, so now that we kind of went over, you know, a little bit of their background and then their joint background, we're going to move into the death, guys. So, uh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so on November 28th, 1981, Natalie boarded RJ's yacht, Splendor, which I thought, I'm like... I don't know if that had anything to do with Splendor in the Grass, but being that he was kind of a psycho... You're reaching. You're reaching. <laughs> you're reaching. And just saying, you know, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Which, this is a yacht that he's had for years at this point, isn't it? I, I don't know. I, I think I read that this is a yacht that he's had for years, and this is, like, it's one of his favorite hobbies, was to have this yacht. To, what do you call it? To go yachting? Yeah. <laughs> Who the fuck says that? I'm gonna go yachting this what? weekend. I'm gonna go pontooning. It, yeah. It was, a, it was a big yacht, too. It was, it was yeah, it was a significant yacht. It was a yacht. It was a splendor. <laughs> so she boarded uh, this yacht with RJ, her new car, uh, car star. <laughs> Her new co-star. Oh my god. (laughs) I'm sorry, what? (laughs) Her new co-star in Brainstorm, Christopher Walken, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) Who's still alive and you still damn well know, and if you don't, how dare you? (laughs) Oh yeah, and we'll get into that too. I don't think Christopher Walken is a garbage person. I just think that he... I, I think that he went, excuse me, what? Yeah. And and (laughs) noped out of that situation. And I, and I think, I think he's just... Not said anything to the media because he's like, again, like, I think he's just saving it for police if they ask him. Well, well yeah, cause because they, I I don't think that he's involved in this whole yeah. thing, but he's definitely a witness. Well, yeah, he's absolutely a witness. And he, he definitely. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. And with the captain, Dennis Davern. So remember Dennis Davern because, well, he will be mentioned again. He's an important He's an important figure. He very this. much is. Um, so the group had left the yacht for dinner on Catalina Island. At 10 p.m., the intoxicated group returned to the yacht using the dinghy, which I think is a hilarious word. Dinghy. And I don't know why there's an H in there. I like that they name their dinghy. Valiant? Yeah. <laughs> their dinghy has a name. Do dinghies it, always have a name? Because don't you think of that little, like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that to- I think a Tommy boy when he goes, quit playing with your, your dinghy. dinghy. Quit playing with your dinghy. <laughs> So Wagner told investigators that Natalie retired to bed at 10.45 p.m. Wagner then talked with Walken for a bit longer before retiring himself. Wagner said when he went to the cabin, Natalie was not there. And the group discovered that the dinghy was missing too. And immediately, I'm actually doing air quotes, guys, immediately Immediately. (laughs) radioed for help. And then uh, let me just, I'm going to interject myself here. Side note. (laughs) So, side note. So, again, they returned to the boat at 10 p.m. She went to bed, according to him, at 10.45 p.m., and he sat out and talked for a bit longer. I couldn't find any specific time. He wasn't like, I talked to walking for 15 minutes. Okay. And I know that this yacht is huge. But you're you're out and about somewhere. And, you know, they're saying, like, oh, she's missing and we don't know what happened. How can you not know? It's How a, can you not know? It was nighttime and they were 
like, um, they were on the boat, but it was on shore. Yeah. Wasn't it or something? It, like, off a They were moored. Something? They were moored. So they moored. weren't, like, out to sea or anything right. by but, like, means. the sea is kind of quiet, isn't it, at night? Like, if there's know. not a whole lot going on. Like, I feel like you would hear a splash. Right. I didn't, there were no reports that there was, like, any, like, rain or anything. So, I mean, I, how, <laughs> this is why I'm like, how can you Come not again. know? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, what? How can you not know? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, back to it. Um, so they discovered that the dinghy was missing and they immediately radioed for help. Include sarcasm on that. Uh, yeah. And then on November 29th, 1981, her body was recovered by authorities and pronounced dead at 70, uh, 70, <laughs> 744 a.m., one mile away from the yacht with a dinghy found nearby. She was wearing a flannel nightgown, socks, and a down jacket. Again, she was terrified of the water. She didn't and, just go into it. And the thing is, is she never learned how to swim. She, yeah, she so, never learned how to swim. She didn't... I think she enjoyed, like, the idea of yachting, but I don't think she liked being on the yacht. No, I think that... Well, I, I think she enjoyed the socializing and all that stuff, but I don't think she actually enjoyed boating and, and the thing is is this is totally a, an assumption i yeah. certainly didn't read this anywhere but i wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if that was a hobby that she partook in because of rj because yeah, it was i a don't think she was his. gonna buy a yacht herself no no i don't and so i mean i can't imagine <laughs> that she would she, willingly enter a water people that knew her her from what i read said there's no way that she would have tried to get in a boat yeah. by herself at night to try to go to shore. Yeah. There's just no way she would have done that. Absolutely. And so on to the autopsy. Autopsy. Jeez. (laughs) The report found bruises on her body and arms along with an abrasion on her left cheek. Her blood alcohol content was 0.14% along with traces of two medications, both of which increased the effects of alcohol. One was a motion sickness pill and one was a painkiller. The motion sickness definitely makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if she had a headache or something. Yeah. Maybe she took a painkiller. No, I feel like back then they just popped whatever. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. It's whatever. Cool. Oh, I got a little headache. It's the 70s. <laughs> I'm just going to do some cocaine or something. <laughs> uh-huh. <I've> escalated. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so the Los Angeles County Coroner, Thomas Naguchi. Nagu- N- yeah, Naguchi. Naguchi ruled her death an accidental drowning in hypothermia. He noted that numerous bruises to her arms and legs that were superficial and probably sustained at the time of her drowning, and there was no other trauma noted, and foul play is not suspected at the time. He said that she, because she had been drinking, obviously, they all had been, that she was probably drunk and may have slipped while trying to reboard the dinghy. But again, I don't care how drunk you are, someone who's terrified of water, I would probably avoid water at all costs, so... Why would she, in a drunken state, be trying to climb into a smaller boat yeah, in the middle do, of the night? To do what? To do what? Where is she going? It's, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. where, where are you going, ma'am? We're approaching the midnight hour at this point. What are you doing? <laughs> and this is not to victim blame. This is just to say, like, I don't buy the story that exactly. they're saying. Th- that's the thing. I'm, we're only saying these things because, again, it just doesn't make it, sense. It doesn't add up when, it you, when you think about her history with this and what has been said and and again stuff. the time frame 10 p.m to like 10 45 p.m you know he's talking and blah 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 with christopher walk christopher walking whatever how can you not hear or see somebody walking around or trying to board a dinghy or a, or splash. a splash of you know, her falling in the water or exactly something. so, so i just don't understand like how can you it doesn't it doesn't add up it just doesn't it doesn't so some just some updates into because this is still very active and very open. Oh yeah, it very active and very is. open. It definitely is. So moving into updates and investigation because there wasn't really like a huge investigation at the time. They kind of just ruled it as an accidental drowning and closed it, and they and cl- closed it really quick. Oh, they closed. Yeah, they closed Super it quick. quick. And you know, Lana, I don't get me wrong. I'm sure there was a lot of public public outcry like Thumb, something's afoot you know but lana definitely was like nope don't buy it yeah don't buy it and who i feel like who knows you better than your sister right you know yeah 
So anyways, into the updates and the current investigation into it. So in November 2011, the case is reopened after Davern. Again, you guys, that was the captain of the ship. Davern publicly stated that he had lied to police during the initial investigation. Said that Natalie and RJ had an argument that night, which... Oh, thanks, Wagner. He mentioned that in his memoir. Yeah, yeah, he mentions a lot of things, it seems like, in his memoir that you're like, and he kind of like, he glosses over. It's kind of like um, that O.J. Simpson book, Had I Done It. Yeah, like, kind of, yeah, yeah, it kind of is. It yeah. seems like he kind of like mentions these things as like, like, whatever, whatever, not a big deal. No like, biggie. There's no evidence. So, like you said, he had lied um, during the initial investigation, said that Natalie and RJ had a huge argument that night. He alleged that she had been flirting with Walken, which enraged RJ. Which she has a history. Remember that stuff with Warren Beatty? He has yeah. a history of, like, being very, very jealous. Very, um, what's the word? Possessive. Um, possessive. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. And after she disappeared, he says that RJ would not allow him to turn on searchlights and notify authorities. Another point um, regarding Davern is at, in that podcast, I'm going to leave, we'll leave the title in the show notes. In the links. And um, but he talks about, because he's on there, as well as Natalie's sister, and he talks about that after this incident happened, RJ insisted that Davern live with him for a year after this happened, and he, like... For what? He kind of kept, kept him kind of captive? Yeah, for sort what? Sort of, like, he couldn't he couldn't really just do what he wanted to do, but he wasn't allowed to talk to the public or press or anything. I, I guess so it's, it's very strange. Like, That's not normal. He held him captive in RJ's, like, mansion, but it was really strange. Yeah, there's nothing normal about that situation. No, it's super weird. At all. So then in 2012, Los Angeles County Coroner Link Shamanan. No offense, sorry. <laughs> Don't know how to say your last name. I felt well, like. Shmanan. When I was typing this, I was like, girl, you can say that. Too, too many an ands. I was like, girl, you got it. You can say it. And now that I'm here in this moment, I, I can't. No. I can't. <laughs> I can't. I can admit that. <laughs> So anyways, this new coroner amended the death certificate and changed the cause from accidental death to drowning other undetermined drowning with other undetermined factors, stating that the circumstances of how she ended up in the water are not clearly established. Again, like we were saying, how'd she get there? Also guys? when when her body was found, they always have to have somebody go identify the body mm -hmm. and Davern said that Wagner would not go and identify her body. He wanted nothing to do with it, and he also shed no tears. He made Davern go and identify her body, mm -hmm. which seems weird. That's your wife. Well, and the thing is, is like, I, I'm, you know, benefit of the doubt, you're in shock, whatever. Still strange. Mm -hmm. You know, and as we've learned, like, through all this, like, our, our true crime adventures together, you can't always put guilt on someone based on their emotions and their reactions. That being said, um, I read that at the funeral, he was like sobbing and like really emotional and everything. But, and Davern said that, Oh, he's a really good actor. He can turn on the tears when he well, needs yeah. to. He did dramatic roles, Jillian. Yeah. He, pl he played a killer. And this is not to say like, those are not what make him seem guilty. No, okay. Those no. just help to paint a picture of something that's going on. No. Yeah, absolutely. So don't take that and go like, oh, he was emotional. He's guilty. No, just kind of, it just helps. It's like another nugget of going the, like, like, huh. Okay. I'm yeah. going to, you know, check that box, log mm -hmm. that away and remember that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then in 2013, the Los Angeles Corner, County Coroner's Office offered a 10-page addendum on the autopsy report. That seems pretty significant. 10 pages, you guys. They stated that she might have sustained some of her bruises on her body before she entered the water. However, this could not be definitively determined. Um, another thing that should be mentioned is that RJ was... Um, he had a lot of connections in Hollywood, mm -hmm. like to political people mm -hmm. and he, he, like he had a lot of connections. So it's not out of the, it's not out of the realm of possibility to say he didn't call in a favor. Oh, absolutely. Because he was friends with a lot of people in politics that had a lot of power. Mm -hmm. So 
therefore he had quite a bit of power himself. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of part of the theory is that he called in some favors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's also noted by forensic pathologist Michael Hunter, he speculated that Natalie at the time was particularly susceptible to bruising due to the drug Synthroid. Now, I didn't actually look that up. I meant to. It's called Synthroid. Let me Google it. Yeah, give her... Let me get a Goog. Give her a quick Goog. Synthroid. So while you're doing that, I guess I'll just continue. Um, Now, you guys, just as recently as February 2018... Robert Wagner was named officially as a person of interest. He continues to this day to deny any involvement. And he does not talk to police at At all. all. Whereas Christopher Walken, you know, kind of returning to him from what we were talking about earlier, he was nothing but uh, cooperative with the police. He did get an attorney right away, which was, I think that's normal. I don't think that is suspicious at all. Right. To get an attorney right away. I just want to point this out to people. Even if you are, like, totally innocent, you should never just openly talk to police. You should always have an attorney. Yeah, always have somebody who, like, knows the law of the land. Because anything you say can definitely be used against you. Yes. Yeah, even if it's just, like, an I'm not saying to don't trust the police, but, like, No, no, but you should also protect yourself, especially... If you are innocent. Right. And I, I don't think anybody has ever um, insinuated that Walken had anything to do with her actual death. He's just a witness, I think. He's just a witness. And I think a lot of people are kind of like, what's the full story? Because there know? were also rumors that maybe part of the reason there was an argument, one of the theories that out th- is out there is that Wagner and him were having an affair. I I don't find anybody that said that that was true or that they thought that was well, true. I yeah. think that's kind of weird, but that is a theory that's floating out there. I don't think there's any truth to that though. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's a whole lot of merit to that. Again, that kind yeah. of goes back to like the whole night she showed up at her parents' house and was yeah. like, "He I caught him cheating with another man." I never found anything or anybody who went actually looked into that statement. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so I looked up Synthroid. And it is a hormone. It can treat hyper hypothyroidism. It can also treat an enlarged thyroid gland and thyroid cancer. Okay. Really random, but yeah. Yeah. So that's what that is. Okay. Now we know, you guys. The now more we you know. know. <laughs> yeah, the more you know. Ding. <laughs> so, um, again, back to 2018, Captain Christopher... Bergner of the homicide department said new witnesses and those with relevant information have been identified and a different timeline had emerged of Natalie's last hours on the boat when help and when help was requested, which I don't think anybody ever really bought that timeline. They shouldn't have. <laughs> cause it was, um, unless you got paid a lot of money. Yeah. Cause it was really vague. And, <laughs> and I will yeah. say it again, how could you not notice someone <laughs> entering the water? I know it was like a 50, 60 foot yacht, but seriously. That would make a, you would hear, I think you would hear that. And there's no way that Natalie just like fell in and was like, okay, I sink. Because, I mean, again, it didn't specifically say where him and Walken were when they were having this conversation. So it's totally an assumption on my part that they were like out on the deck or something, just based on how it was stated that oh she retired to the cabin and he stayed out talking to him. They could have very well been been like in like the bar area of the yacht because you know there was a bar on there. It's it's like a fifty foot yacht. Yeah, and this case is seriously moving. <laughs> seriously moving. <laughs> Um, so, to do, where was I? A lieutenant in the Los Angeles Sheriff's oh, Department yeah. of Homicide Bureau, John Cornea, said that Robert Wagner was, quote, a person of interest in her death and they would like to speak with him again and hear his version of events. Which, again, because they, I mean, he did speak to police a little bit. Right then, but has not since. It has not since. It's been since. like 40 years or yeah. something. So, I mean, he's just like, oh, this is what happened. Yeah, no. Uh huh. I don't think it's what happened, RJ. Just I saying. I don't think so either. I don't buy it. I don't either. So the new witnesses were people in boats moored near the yacht who heard a couple loudly arguing, as well as a woman calling for help. Mm-hmm. Now, when I read this, 
I was kind of like, if you hear someone calling for help, help her. Well, okay, so here's... I They were on that podcast, this woman that said oh, that she okay. heard this. And she said that when they heard this, she told her husband, like, oh my god, you need to call for help. And they kept trying to call the Coast Guard. They could never get through to somebody. Mm-hmm. So then he, she was like, well, I'm going to go out there and try to find her. And her husband's like, it's dark out. You have no idea where she is because noise at night kind of oh, carries differently. on the water, Yeah, too. and he's like... You're gonna have no idea where she is, where she to even be out start. Really far. And if she you could, yeah. right, and if you get out and try to help her, she might accidentally drown you too. Yeah. So she I said that they tried to call like they did, dozens of times. They, and they did what get, they could. Yeah, and they couldn't get a hold of anybody, and they couldn't find her. Well, yeah, because this is the middle of the night too. Mm-hmm. So it, I suppose when you really put it like that, it's a very helpless situation. Yeah, so they could just hear her, but they couldn't find her. They couldn't see her. They couldn't get a hold of anybody to help her. Mm-hmm. Okay, I suppose I'll get I'll give them that. Yeah, so they definitely tried. They she was on there. Yeah, talk about, and she actually said she hadn't come forward with this information prior to that because she had received a note like in the mail or something like that saying like don't come forward with this information. Um, Otherwise, you know, like, basically bad things will happen. See, I didn't listen to this podcast, and I really should have, and I probably will after that. It's be- pretty interesting. Because they, they, for it's the, a very good. For the little bit that I did listen to, it, it was really good. It's essentially like they a documentary. A, yes, they have a lot of people that were directly involved talking mm-hmm. on this. It's really good. If you have any interest in this case, definitely listen to that. It's yes. really well put together. And they have tons of interviews. Tons. From all sorts of people. and all a lot the main with, players. Yeah, definitely with her sister, which I think is really great to kind of get her perspective yes. on. Because, um, you know... She was around for all, all of this. this. All of it. And she kind of put some context into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lastly, I'd like to add that uh, Corina added that his department have also talked to witnesses who saw the group on Catalina Island that weekend, as well as people who knew Wagner and Wood... Some of the details that have emerged about the last hours of the yacht are ugly with whispers of drunkenness, rage, and accused infidelity. Boom. Boom. That's it, you guys. That's all the information that I found. And, well, basically, just to kind of bullet point and get through it, but... Yeah, I've always thought it was a really interesting case because, again, she was petrified of water. How did she get there? Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that just don't make sense, and... This case is still very active, even mm-hmm. as of last year, so mm-hmm. I really think that there's probably going to be some interesting things that are going to come up, so definitely keep your eyes out for updates on this one. And I feel like this is the year of, like, mysteries being solved. because I with, agree. Because within the last couple of years, so many, like, decades old, like, murder mysteries have been solved. You know, yes. things that have happened in our uh, lifetime, things that have happened before our lifetime. So, yeah, definitely, again, if you're interested, follow up because there's there are still things happening and I am very interested. And I'm sure um, we have an Instagram that I'll leave down in the show notes. It's just, excuse me, what podcast. But I'm sure if there are updates, we will be putting them on there oh, because yeah. I'm super interested to see what happens with this case. And I would definitely love to do uh an update on this like a good update an update of justice justice being served because there i just do not buy that she accidentally drowned yeah i i don't either given the history the jealousy the obsession um the you know the possessiveness i just and if you listen to that podcast it'll give you like more in-depth like context as to how he was yeah because as soon as this happened he stopped talking to her family, too. Like, he didn't invite Lana to, like, her niece's birthday parties mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, well, and also to note, uh, so her daughter that she had with Gregson, he essentially kind of adopted her. I yes. mean, he raised her from, uh, you know, year one. And she even, you know, she doesn't think that he did it. And I don't really blame them either because, like, you... I, like, if... Unless I was approached with overwhelming evidence Like of if that, somebody came up to me and said, oh, dad murdered someone. I'd say, fuck you. Get the hell out of my face. Yeah. No, I didn't. My dad's cool. <laughs> my dad's cool as fuck. He would never do that. Yeah. So, yeah, I I don't know. It's the, This is a very interesting case. 
But yeah, that's kind of where it is right now. Yeah, if there are any updates, we'll definitely post them on our social media. And if there's an overwhelming amount of like updates, we'll definitely do an update but, episode. Yeah, but let us know on like Twitter or our Instagram, like what are your thoughts on this case? Have you researched it? Mm-hmm. What do you think happened? Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that RJ and Christopher Walken were having an affair? I don't think so. But do you? I just, yeah. <laughs> we want to know. Yeah, we want to know all of the things. Um, but follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And you can follow me on Instagram. I'm Jillian Chair. And I am Mia Bia 1637 on and, Instagram. And the podcast one is just True Crime. Or <laughs> true Crime. No, no, no. <laughs> not that. Not come, that. Come again. <laughs> It's Try again. Ex- excuse me, what podcast? <laughs> yeah, so check us out. We're on Twitter. Um, we're on check Instagram. Out, yeah, check out the show notes. I'll have everything linked there. And um, I'll leave the podcast name that we're recommending, The Fatal Voyage. I'll leave that down in the show notes as well. And also, if you ever have any suggestions for episode ideas, tweet us. Tweet us. Because again, we're not just... We have a running list. Oh yeah, we definitely do. It's a And we're covering a wide swath of topics. Oh yeah. Anything weird, true crime, paranormal, paranormal. UFOs, aliens. If you see... If you see that there are sightings of UFOs, let us know. Tell me that shit. Okay. I want to know because I personally believe that aliens are rare and they're already here. Jillian is really into that. I'm... Me yeah. not so much. Freaks me out. Freaks me out. Yeah, it's happening. <laughs> it's real. We're having an Independence Day type thing Is it? Is an alien going to show up at my birthday party? They probably already have. <laughs> God, no. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're here, man. <laughs> I think they're here. Okay, anyways. I digress. Di- different podcast episode, but... Thank you so much for listening. If you want to support the show, please leave us a rating, a five-star rating, and... (laughs) Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your friends. Tell your family. And next week, I think we will be covering the Black Dahlia. So if you're interested for that, subscribe. And yeah, I think that's all we got today, right? Yeah, thank you for joining us for our very first episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.